Hi, in this video you're going to see a zoomed in focus on Laocoon, the guy in the Aeneid Book 2 who uh, tries to warn the Trojans that the Greeks uh, had planted that horse there to get inside the city. Um, it's a very interesting role. This is, of course, Aeneas telling the story of what happened at Troy to Dido, and um, he recalls Laocoon in an interesting way because Laocoon has the knowledge of the reader. The reader is supposed to know the Trojan horse is full of Greeks because it's in hindsight for the reader. This is something famously in Homer's epics and something that everybody would know already. And so you see an interesting um, case study of Laocoon, uh, and he has the reader's knowledge. Um, and he's trying to warn them. It's what the reader wants to be doing. You know, no, you fools, don't let it into the city. That's what Laocoon's doing for you. Um, but he also, uh, he is, he's representative of something that I'm going to bring up at the end of the video. It's something uh, I think that is very, very important. One of the themes of the Aeneid uh, that is kind of uh, continued from the Odyssey and Iliad is uh, a person's relationship with fate. Um and so we're going to analyze Laocoon, see what happens to him, and then uh, kind of uh, look at some art as we discuss the theme that I want you to take away from Book 2 and Laocoon. And you'll realize that Book 2 is uh, has a few of the characters uh, or, uh, or entities that have to deal with fate in this way. And some of them aren't. Uh, innocent. Some of them deserve a bit of fate. Some of them do not. So it's it's an interesting uh, study in fate. Uh, book two is and uh, kind of analyzing the people that uh, that have to encounter the fate. So let's get started on some some key Latin that's actually um, from the AP curriculum. And so um, if you're an AP student, this is also helpful for you. If you're a Latin two student, this is helpful for you. So um, hopefully uh, anybody that watches this can kind of follow along uh, with some kind of value. Aeneas kind of starts his story uh, with um, with the horse just being on the beach. Um, you kind of uh, you're supposed to kind of know the story of the Iliad um, and how the, the the war was going back and forth and back and forth, and the Greeks were finally uh, in a position after they lose Achilles. Um, that they don't really know uh, what they can do. So Hector's dead but uh, on the Trojan side, but Achilles is dead on the Greek side. So um, what are they going to do without Achilles? They can't beat Troy without, uh, without Achilles. And so um, you, uh, you're going to see here uh, kind of the, uh, the, the Trojans analyze what's going on with this horse, the, the horse that ends up being, of course, the downfall. Troy. Uh, it starts right with the Trojans kind of staring at the at the giant horse on the beach, and they're wondering what it is. Um, and so uh, Laocoon kind of comes in here. Primus ibant omnes magna comitante caterva Laocoon larden summa de cura taborque et proco. O misery quite hanta insania quives. We'll stop there for a second. Um, and uh, we'll keep going as we uh, as we kind of translate along, um, and so um, so you get your nominative here, primus uh, going with Laocoon in the next line. So first Laocoon, uh, ante omnis in front of everybody, magna comitante caterva, nice ablative absolute there. You see this beautiful uh, present active participle with the NT and your, your E ending for the third declension uh, with a great crowd gathering. Um, so like imagine that scene. Like, there's a great crowd gathering and Laocoon, he's first in front of everybody is going to do a thing. Ardens, nice NS ending. Uh, he's raging. Uh Summa de cura tabarque. The summa goes with arche there. Um, so from the highest citadel runs down at Procol. Um, kind of gapping your and he says, um, "O oh, misery, quiet hanta insania kives." Um, the vocatives here interrupt uh, interrupt the question. The question is actually the quiet hanta insania part. Um, that uh, if you see the end, you see a question mark. The the uh, the quiet hanta insania. Uh, you're assuming your verb asked. Uh, what such great insanity is this? Um, 
And then uh, your vocative, he's talking to the misery kives. Oh, poor citizens. Oh, miserable citizens. Oh, poor citizens. What such great insanity is this? Um, of course, Laocoon is the one who kind of judges the horse badly. Um, and remember, they all think uh, that the great crowd is thinking this is a gift to the gods. This is not to be insulted or anything like that. So having Laocoon kind of charge down and says, what great insanity is this? Um, is it, it, It's telling um, of Laocoon's character, somebody who uh, kind of knows better, somebody who uh, you know has has knowledge of these things and the people doesn't, don't, don't seem to. Uh, Creditis avectos hostes, aut ula putatis dona carere, Dolis dananum, sic notus uciles, lixe, sorry. Um, so let's do those next two lines. I see your tis ending for the second person. Uh, do you believe? Uh, this is actually a little mini uh, indirect statement. Uh, you have to gap your essay here. Um, so your avectos essay, uh, and that's an austase um, instead of austis. Um, that's just a, an archaic form uh, if you're not as familiar with Virgil. So do you trust that the enemies have been carried away? Uh, avectos essay, uh, veho, to carry ah, away. So ah, avectos, carry away. Okay. Um, do you trust that the enemies have been carried away? Out. Ula putatis dona. A uh, nice um, agreement there. Ula going with dona. Um, putatis, another second person. Do you think, or do you think that any uh, gifts lack from the tricks of the Greeks? In other words, do you don't you do you think that any gifts uh, are without tricks? Uh, of the Greeks, um, uh, a, sort of a rhetorical question. Of course, the answer is that all the gifts should um, should include tricks of the Greeks. Um, the, do you think that any gifts lack them? Um, the answer should be no. Seek uh, notus ulixes. Notice again, you are gapping in your est um, because you're trying to save meter, uh, and also he's kind of hurrying up while he speaks. So you have, like, isn't Achilles known for this? Uh, the, the seek being thus, like, is, isn't uh, is, is you, uh, Odysseus known thus? Um, notice being the word for known. Uh, Ulixes is an interesting, uh, it's, it's uh, Odysseus, but uh, his name is Ulysses in Latin, and U Ulixes, so um, nice, a uh, nice little nod to Odysseus's trickery. Um, notice how Ulysses and the the lacking of tricks are in the same line, of course. All right, let's keep going here. Out uh, inclusi Aut uh, aik in nostros fabricates machina muros, inspectura domos ventura que de super urbi, aut aliquis late terror, econe crediti tucri. All right, let's stop there. That's a, that's a good chunk. So I'll draw that line. I'll delete it when we get down there if it's in the way. Um, so we have some agreement here. Hulk agrees with Ligno. Um, and so you get inclusi going with akivi. Nice little um, nice word order here. The cool thing about this word order I'll talk about in a second after we translate. Um, but uh, you get your apple of a place in this wood. Uh, of course, the horse is made of wood. Um, so we have like concealed Greeks. Either concealed Greeks are hiding in this wood or something else is going to happen. But um, notice you're out, out, either or. Um... So either uh, concealed Greeks are are hidden or hiding have been hidden in this wood. Um, oh, sorry, are hidden. Um, that's that's not uh, perfect passive, but um, the cool thing about this is that you get um, inclusi akivi with this nice like meshed word order with Hulk Ligno. Um, the the, uh, the 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 hidden Greeks and the wood are kind of um, kind of meshed together uh, as the Greeks are hiding within the wood, um, and so the agreement is is kind of hiding from you. Um, that that meshing is very common in Virgil. He likes to kind of combine ideas or make little word pictures out of them, uh, even when they're a little bit contrived. It seems like uh, Virgil still likes to try it. Um, Out hike in nostros fabricates machinos muros. Or machina muros, um, and so you get um, hike is of course the um, the, uh, the 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 horse I believe, um, 
and uh, you get in Nostros here. Uh, it goes with Moros, actually. Ah, height goes with Machina. I'm sorry, as I read linearly. Um, or this uh, machine, this mechanism, of course, referring to the horse, has been created against our walls. Um, in other words, uh, this uh, either there's like hidden Greeks or the, like this this horse is some kind of siege weapon um, has been made against our walls. It's like a siege weapon. Um, and then Inspectura about to look into our homes. Uh, Inspectura domos. About to look into our homes. Ventura que de super urbi. Uh, and about to come from above, uh, up above our city. Um, or aliquis latet error. Or some other trick lies hidden. Equo ne crediti tu cri. Uh, equo here is dative. Uh, that's going to be important in a second. Um, I hope you remember your dative object verbs because credity happened. Now, credite. Credite has an ite ending, which is a, an imperative. Equo ne credite. Uh, do not trust the horse, tu Koreans. Uh, of course, Laocoon telling them it's probably a trick. Don't take it into the city. Don't even, don't even get near it. And then one of the most famous lines of the Aeneid, uh, at least in book two, uh, for sure, quid quid it est, temeo danaos et dona ferentis. Uh, whatever it is, quid quid it est, whatever it is, temeo, I fear the danaos, the Greeks, et dona ferentis, even bearing gifts. So, like, I don't even trust these guys when they're bringing me gifts. Like, I, the gifts are probably, like, a, like a, some kind of poison. And he's right. Um, however, uh, it, it's, it's just a very interesting line of, like, what enemies entail. Uh, even their gifts are, are somehow uh, tainted. Uh, kind of like that line. Um, but anyway... Uh, I think this is a good uh, stopping point if you need to rewind. Um, I'm going to kind of pause for a second um, on that line because the quote is over and uh, Laocoon is done talking. He's going to do something really quick that's going to be important for the next part. All right, so... Um, okay. Sic fatus validis in gentem viribus asta min latus in que feri curvam compagibus ovrum contorset. And so we're going to stop there at the nice enjambment. He end the sentence right at the beginning of the next line. Uh, having spoken thus, fatus, see, that's, a, that's actually a perfect deponent participle, fatus. Having spoken thus, uh, validis in gentem viribus astam. Uh, notice again this nice meshing of word order here. In gentem going with astam, validis going with viribus. Um, and your verb is, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat a second to go down here. Uh, contorsit is your verb. So having spoken thus, he, um, he throws into the side a huge spear. Oh, sorry, into the side is right here. Uh, a huge spear, and then Walidis Viribos being ablative with legit strength. I like legit there. Uh, Walidis uh, means like he didn't just like lob it for fun. Uh, it was it was a legit effort. Um, so legit strengths. Uh, notice the plural there. I like. I don't. I don't think we pluralize in English so much. I'm going to use the uh, the singular there. Uh, but with legit strength, he tosses. Um, a huge spear into the side and into uh, the curvam olvum, the side uh, curved at the joints of the beast, the fairy of the beast, of the wild, uh, the wild animal. Uh, it's, of course, referring to the horse. It's not a real wild beast. Um, but he, so he chucks a spear at the horse and, and um, like, he, he clearly is showing his disrespect. If it is a gift of the gods, this would be a huge sacrilege. But Laocoon knows better. He knows that it's a trick. So he throws the spear at it. Statitila tremens. Utero que recuso in sonueric havae gemitum que dedere cavernae. And so you get, uh, and it stood trembling. Uh, nice, uh, nice present active participle here with the ns. Uh, your nominative and your verb. Uh, it stood trembling. A nice ablative absolute here as well. Ute uh, que and with the belly having been uh, struck, having been struck. 
Um, kawai. Insonuere. Insonuere kawai. The, the, um, the hollows echoed. You remember the hollow horse, right? The hollows echoed. And, uh, again, the word hollows. I'm going to talk about that in a second. The hollows gave a groan, a gametum. Um, so you can imagine, like, this kind of, like, old beech wood is probably, like, uh, as, like, it kind of gets, like, struck by the spear where the guy is, like, heaving at it. Um, but the very cool thing about this line, um, this is kind of the artistry of Virgil here. Uh, you see cavae, cavernae. Um, they both mean hollow. Uh, one's kind of the, the noun form, one's the, no, uh, the, the verb, or uh, the adjective form. Um, but, uh, it's a, it, 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 the sound that you're hearing is an echo, and he echoes the sound cav. In sonware, cavai, gametum, quedere, cavernae. Dum, dum. Like, it's, a, it's an echo of the word. It's like, it's the echo that it is created uh, with the strike of the spear um, is reflected in the language itself. I think that's so cool. Uh, Virgil does a great job there. Et si fata deum, si mens non live fuiset. Impulerat ferro agricolas foidare la tebras. Troiae que nunc staret priami que arx alta maneres. Very important that ascending at the very end, it kind of changes a lot of the tone. You realize Aeneas is getting into the story, but we'll get to that in a second. And if the fates of the gods, if our minds had not been tr like trivialized, uh, liva is light or dumb, like if our minds had not been dumb, uh, yeah, sorry, it's all singular, but like it's it, it should like you know in in, in English I guess like uh, it's it's an interesting singular uh, considering um, we're talking about the minds of many people. But if the mind had not been uh, stupid, uh, life is like it, it trivial. Um, it's like it, we would have. I, I put a we in there. I'm sorry. Like this is Aeneas telling the story. It, it, it's it's third singular, but I just I feel like it's it fits the story better. We. Uh, we would have ruined the, um, hang on a minute, let's, let's draw some arrows. The, uh, the Trojan, or the, uh, the, sorry, the Greek, uh, hiding place, La Tebras, um, I'm sorry, we would have, we would have compelled, uh, we would have been compelled to ruin the Greek hiding places with a sword. Nice ablative there. Oops. Uh, there we go. And now Troy would stand. Notice the subjunctive there as a hypothetical. Now Troy would stand and the high citadel of Priam. But then instead of would remain, it's you, high citadel of Priam, would remain. Aeneas begins at this point right here, and I'm scribbling right there. He begins talking to the fallen city of Troy in such emotion. Uh, I love this. It's a nice apostrophe. Um, talking to things that ought not be talked to. Um, and so he uses that second person all of a sudden to say, like, oh, you, Troy, you would remain. Oh, it's so good. High citadels of Priam. Anyway, uh, the artistry in these lines is is just absolutely stunning. Um, and this is, a, of course, Aeneas telling the story to Dido. So this is him kind of pouring out his heart, uh, kind of knowing what happens. Remember, he's telling this in hindsight. So he knows what happens because um, he's telling the story. And uh, he's he's saying like oh if we hadn't been so dumb we would we would, like Troy would still remain to this day like this was the Greeks' last effort and we would have easily um, just come away uh, unscathed if we uh, if we hadn't uh, you know brought it into the city, but they do. Um, but Laocoon's not done yet, um, so let's kind of move on uh, for time's sake here. Um, I'm not going to read every single uh, word of this thing. I'm actually going to read a lot of it in Latin just to show you some cool stuff. Um, but for time's sake, we're coming up on already 17 minutes on this one slide. Um, and that's just the first part. So what I'm going to do is um, we're going to get to some, some important parts. It's actually more important uh, just uh, to see some visuals here. Um, and reading it a lot in Latin is going to be a bit more important. But uh, the next slide uh, where we kind of talk about it is, I think, where we're going to um, to get a, a good sense for uh, for what's going on here.
Uh, but the first part we're going to translate, of course, because um, this is kind of the, the, the most important part. And then uh, as the, the description get more, gets more detailed, I will um, just kind of read it in Latin and tell you what's happening um, and show you some cool stuff uh, along the way. So, Lea quan ductus Neptuno sorte sacerdos solumnis taurum ingentum actabat ad aras. having been led as a priest... For Neptune by Lot. In other words, this guy is a priest. This guy is not somebody that doesn't know anything. He knows gifts to the gods. He's a priest of Neptune. He knows what's going on. Notice the date of Neptuno there. He's a priest to Neptune. Um, this is not unusual, uh, but you might you might expect uh, a genitive of, um, but it is uh, it is a dative there. Um, sorte means by 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 Lot by fate. In other words, he he did not um, choose that. It just it, it happened to him. Um, so he. Uh, he sacrificed. Uh, he sorry. He brought a uh, a huge bull in Gentum Taurum, right there, the accusative, um, to the solemn altars. And you'll realize he's setting up a. Lacoan is setting up a sacrifice. Um, but it uh, it kind of gets it gets cut short because of uh, what happens next here. Eke. Eke means, like, behold, look. Uh, so something's going to happen. Eke autem gemini e atenedo tranquila peralta. Um, twins, some, oh, we're going to get to that in a second. It goes with angues but, uh, in the next line. But uh, twins uh, from tenedos through the tranquil water. It's important that you don't know that gemini goes with angues quite yet because when you read this line, your expectation is actually that you're talking about Greeks because you're talking about the two brothers, uh, Agamemnon and Menelaus, twins coming from the sea. Uh, the Greeks sailed into Troy. Uh, Tenedos is an island in that direction, um, like right off the coast there. So it looks like they're coming from the island of Tenedos. Like, so it's twins, um, like the Greeks, coming from the, the island of Tenedos through the tranquil water. Um, notice the, the tranquil water, of course, being important because it seems like the peace. Uh, we, we, the, the Greeks are gone, right? Uh, we have peace, the tranquil water, but like these, these twins are coming. But it ends up, ended up being a giant metaphor, these twins snakes um actually it's not a metaphor because he actually uh because of what they do but um it's kind of something very mythological a uh, horesco referens uh, recalling it i uh, i shudder uh twin snakes immensis orbibus uh incumbunt palago pariter ad litora tendunt uh, i'll translate this part but then after that we're going to just read aloud and i'm going to uh talk about some sounds that he that um that Virgil makes, um, but it says uh, snake, uh, twin snakes with immense coils. Uh, they rise on the water, and they uh, at the same time pari, uh, pariter, um, kind of in the same place. They uh, they head toward the shores, um, and so you can see, you can get this visual of Laocoon trying to make a sacrifice with this giant bull, and then like you kind of get these two giant snakes start swimming through the water toward the shore. Uh, remember, he's they're on a coast. All right. Um, so uh, one thing I want I want to read aloud this line for you one more. Actually, these two lines one more time. Horresco referens immensis orbibus angues. Um, notice. Um, Horesco referens immensis orbibus angues. There's a lot of S's in this line on purpose. Um, and uh, or of course we're talking about snakes. So you're going to see Virgil making these very interesting, uh, like onomatopoetic uh, sounds. I'm going to I'm going to keep reading for you uh, with an emphasis on the S. It's very cool. Um, the next part I'm I'm just going to tell you now is like description of the snakes. It's talking about their backs being just huge and they're like their eyes are are kind of like blazing uh, and they're like kind of bloodshot and uh, their their tongues are licking the air and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. So um, I'm just going to read it out loud for. You. Pectora quorum inter fluctus a recta ubaque sanguineae superant undas pars ketera pontum pone legget sinuat que immensa volumen eterga fit sonitus spumante salo 
jamque arva tenebat, ardentisque uh, oculos affecti sanguine et in sibila lambebat linguis vibrantibus ora. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just like point out to you like all of the S's. I hope you heard some of them. Um, when I read that, it was... Uh, I was trying to both move and make sure I pronounced all the S's with an extra S. Um, you notice all these little green lines? There's tons of these little things. All right, so there's tons of S sounds. Uh, he used that on purpose. Um, and so that's cool. But then the, the minute he talks about the tongues, he stops hissing and he starts using a lot of L's and B's here. Because if you think about how a snake's tongue works, it kind of flickers, right? It kind of goes... Blah, 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 blah. Um, and it makes like a like an LB sound. Lambe bat linguist vibranti bosora. It's, it's, so, it's such like a... Like a buda, 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 buda. Because it has... Like it's supposed to be like this like fake sound of a snake's tongue bouncing up and down. I kind of love it. Um, but anyway... Um, yeah, it's it, it's this it's this kind of crazy description of the snakes. Uh, we're gonna move it down just a little bit, um, but anyway, uh, you get you get this next part um, in Latin here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too much through it, but um, it essentially uh, like he they 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 kind of attack him while he's at this altar, and then his sons come by and they start like strangling them, but all of them, um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll translate this line right here. Uh, because Laocoon's the subject, uh, he lifts at the same time horrible screams to the stars, such groans um, as when uh, Saucius Taurus, another bull, flees the altar. In other words, um, that bull that we were just sacrificing, we realize Laocoon is then compared to him when he's yelling, getting strangled by these snakes. Um, and when uh, kind of an, uh, he, he is, um, he's, a, he's hit in the neck with a uncertain ax. In other words, like somebody tried to sacrifice him and they like missed or something and like wounded him and, the, and this bull is going crazy. So like you can see... Um, the connection between the bull that he was going to sacrifice and Lock Leakwan himself, um, he becomes the sacrifice in a certain sense, um, which is it, it, it's it's supposed to be a little bit of a really sad uh, image when you realize that Leakwan um, is he has to deal with this fate where uh, you know he's done very little wrong, and this is what I'm going to talk about, like kind of looking at the next slide. But I want you to keep in mind that the only thing he might have done wrong, we did translate up here. He threw the spear at the horse. Now, if it had been a real gift to the gods, um, you would understand that like there'd be kind of divine uh, retribution here. But you realize since since it was a trick. There's really no purpose for the punishment. It, this is injustice happening, and this is why I want to point out the um, that fate uh, has a very interesting role in book two because um, usually when you think about fate, when and something really bad happens like this, like somebody gets like swallowed up by snakes, or there's some kind of retribution. It's like it's because they did something, or they they angered somebody or something, but. Um, Leakwan didn't. Uh, he didn't do any of that. Uh, he he's a priest, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about this when we look at some art on the next slide here. So, this is one of the most famous uh, statues to come out of the uh, the ancient world, and definitely probably. Um, Maybe with the exception of a Bernini, um, one of the most famous statues that come out of the Aeneid, for sure, the story of the Aeneid. Um, I'm thinking, of course, of Bernini's Aeneas um, carrying his father and his uh, drag kind of pulling his son along. Um, that's in the Borghese Gallery. But this one here in the Vatican Museum uh, is, oh my, it's my favorite. It's so good. Um, but like like I just said, this is, this is kind of on the theme of book two um, that... You get the suffering of the innocent. This is somebody who hasn't done anything wrong. A priest who simply interpreted a true thing um, and was about to make a sacrifice to the gods. He's a pious man. Um, and he's, he's, he's punished because he's in the way of fate. Because fate is that Troy falls and he's getting in the way. And so 
what you get is a little bit of a statement by Virgil here that fate is unfair. And I think that that's one of the keys to take out of book two is that fate, it, it may or may not be deserved. Um, and in this case, it's definitely not deserved. Um, so Lehakawan, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the art here. You see the snakes kind of wrapping around uh, him and his sons here. But the, the key to this uh, is, the, is his face. Oh, that's, not, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay. Look at his face. So you can see the expression on his face. You can see the wrinkles in his brow that show the helplessness, um, the suffering of the innocent. Uh, somebody who has done nothing wrong is pure good, and he, in, interestingly, represents the knowledge of the reader, and he gets unfairly killed by snakes, of all things. He doesn't, like, die in battle. It's not, like, a, any kind of heroic death. He just kind of gets divinely punished by a couple divine snakes that are loyal to Athena. And uh, you can see on his face, I love the, the artwork there. Um, you, can, you can almost grab that expression on his face, and and you can feel it with him, the unfairness of it all, uh, the looking up at the gods, and remember I told you he shouted the, like the, the, the many shouts to the stars, um, and you can almost see that happening here, um, not just in pain of the snakes, but also in the unfairness of fate, and I think that that's one of the most important things to take out of the Laocoon story. But um, anyway, thank you for watching. I hope um, I hope this uh, this video finds you uh, happily reading the Aeneid, and uh, make sure to ask any questions to me via email or uh, in office hours. Thank you.